He's been called the world's most wanted man. NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden joins me on our very first Upfront. I'm Mehdi Hassan and welcome to a new show Upfront on Al Jazeera. Protests in Baghdad, ISIL undefeated and the Kurds unhappy. Is it time for Iraq to consider a formal partition? I'll ask the country's ambassador to the United States. But first, four decades after Daniel Ellsberg leaked the Pentagon Papers, helping to bring about an end to the Vietnam War, another whistleblower emerged from within the US intelligence community. Hailed by some as a hero, branded a traitor by others, he's transformed the global debate over privacy, liberty and security. This week's headliner from Moscow, Edward Snowden. Edward Snowden, thanks for joining me on Upfront. We're also joined from San Francisco by Daniel Ellsberg. Edward Snowden, let me start with you. What quality, what characteristic do you think defines a whistleblower? What makes someone such as yourself uh, or Daniel uh, go public with state secrets, take such massive risks with your reputation, with your career, with your safety? It's a very difficult uh, and kind of complex question because I typically don't classify people. I don't like the, the, the whistleblower terminology, the hero terminology or traitor terminology. Uh, anything where we're otherizing people, it creates distance between them. But if we want to think about the general behaviors that people share, the general choices that they make, I think it ultimately comes down to you see a structure of laws where the legality of the times are becoming more and more divorced from the morality of our daily lives, the daily decision making, the sort of values we hold. And when we have that, you ultimately have to make a choice about what do you have a greater commitment to, the law or to justice? And that's what, that's what being a whistleblower is about to me. Daniel, do you share that view? What was going through your mind back in 1971 when you took that decision to go up against the US government over Vietnam? Well, I feel a great identity with Edward Snowden. I think a whistleblower tends to be an insider who has been aware for some time often and been silent about abuses or injustices, uh, crimes, lies, like many of his colleagues uh, have been aware. And there comes a time when he or she realizes it's wrong to continue to be silent, to hold these secrets away from the outsiders who are being harmed by the secrecy of that information. Edward, a lot of people uh, shrug their shoulders and say, so what if spy agencies spy on people? That's what they're paid to do. Or they say, if you've got nothing to hide, you should, you've got nothing to fear. When I hear that, I think, you know, saying that you don't care about the right to privacy because you have nothing to hide is no different than saying you don't care about freedom of speech because you have nothing to say. It's a fundamentally un-American principle. And more than just nationalism, more than just what this country is about, uh, it's a deeply anti-social principle because rights are not just individual, they're collective. And what may not have value to you today may have value to an entire you know, population, an entire people, uh, or an entire way of life tomorrow. And if you don't stand up for it, then who will? In 2009, back when you were working for the CIA, I believe, you went on an internet chat forum and wrote that people who leak classified information to the press should be, quote, shot in the balls. How did you go from being that guy <laughs> to being the guy responsible for the biggest leak of government secrets in US history? Well, so first off, I have to say as a privacy advocate that I've never claimed authorship of that. And it would be sort of irresponsible for me to uh, say people who have been digging into these uh, old statements and, and trumpeting them to sort of criticize someone, uh, that's something we should support. But for the purpose of, for the sake of argument, let's say yes, let's say I wrote that. Um, if I did write that, it's important to, to think about the fact that it doesn't really matter what anybody thinks at a given point in their development, right? Because I came from a federal family. And when you're someone like me who sort of grows up in the system where you believe everything the government says is likely to be true, because why would they possibly lie to us? And you find more and more clear evidence that not only is the public being misled, uh, but they're being misled on the basis of programs that are not effective uh, and in some ways are actively harmful you have to think about how would that change your view you know how would that change your personality and what would you do 
But as for harmful, you've also argued in the past uh, that they're illegal, they're unconstitutional. Uh, and yet last week, we saw a federal appeals court in Washington seem to suggest that what the NSA is doing in terms of collecting phone data, etc., cetera, uh, may be legal, which, if that's the case, would be a blow to your cause, would it not? There is no longer a question of whether the NSA's mass surveillance programs were legal or illegal. Uh, that's actually been resolved in the ACLU versus Clapper when it was ruled that these programs were uh, unlawful. The issue that we're seeing in the courts, uh, and this is an ongoing thing for the last 50 years, is that courts won't tell you whether or not a program is lawful or unlawful until you can prove that it actually exists. And when the government denies that these programs exist, the only way we can ever get a hearing on whether they're lawful or unlawful, uh, constitutional or unconstitutional, is if we have whistleblowers come forward and reveal actual classified evidence, which allows the courts to say under their own rules, this is a real program, this is a real controversy okay. that must be resolved. There's a big debate about how you ended up living in Russia. Regardless of how you got there, you did choose of your own volition to say this about Russia once you arrived. These nations, including Russia, have my gratitude and respect for being the first to stand against human rights violations. They have earned the respect of the world. Surely you must now, listening to that, regret making that pretty odd statement, given Russia's own awful human rights record. Um, is it something you want to withdraw? Do you want to take that statement back? Well, no, I think it's out of context. So it's important to actually look at it in a broader perspective. It was a list of nations. Yes. Uh, and the specific context of the statement was the first to stand up against the violations of the powerful. Yes, you, you referred to Venezuela, Bolivia, Nicaragua, Ecuador. But you did start the sentence with Russia, and you then said, earn the respect of the world. A lot of people see Russia's actions in Chechnya, Russians' actions abroad in terms of dealing with dissidents, journalists at home, and say, under no scenario is Russia a small nation, and under no scenario should it earn the respect of the world on human rights. When I was speaking about this, I wasn't talking about the government specifically. I was talking about the nation, the nation as a people. Uh, and when you think about what's going on with these different populations, they're all struggling. And yes, when you look in Russia uh, domestically, they have huge human rights difficulties, as with many other countries around the world. But what you also see in these countries is that there's a very strong movement to improve human rights. And while the government itself may work against that, the people obviously are trying to advance that. And I think that's something to improve. And I would point out that I've been extremely critical of Russia's human rights record, particularly as it relates to the internet, uh, because we've seen a growing amount of censorship, a growing amount of uh, critical, controlling, bad, and honestly, completely unnecessary laws. Would you describe President Putin as an authoritarian leader, a dictator? How would you describe him? I think, I don't think anybody would question the, uh, the assertion that he's an authoritarian leader. That's sort of his brand. What happens in August 2017? almost exactly two years from now, when your temporary uh, asylum period in Russia expires, where do you go next? Is the US, uh, is, it, is a US return a possibility? We had uh, President Obama's former Attorney General, Eric Holder, recently saying uh, that the possibility of a plea deal uh, was still on the table. Although other US officials have said that the chances of a deal are now, quote, close to non-existent. Right. So all of the officials that say close to non-existent are speaking anonymously off the record. Uh, Eric Holder did make a significant uh, sort of concession there, which is that people recognize that uh, sort of a show trial, which is what's on the table right now, is not in the interests of the public. Uh, it's not in the interests of the government. It's not in anyone's interests, uh, including my own. Uh, I have been uh, consistent in saying that the only thing I want from the government in order to come back and stand trial is guarantees of a fair trial where I can, you know, put forth a public interest defense. Let me put that point to uh, Daniel Ellsberg. Uh, Daniel, a lot of people say Edward Snowden should follow your example. Come back regardless of whatever terms are offered and face a court of law. What do you say to them? I think Edward Snowden uh, learned from my example and from that of many others like Tom Drake and really all of the whistleblowers who have been tried under President Obama. Uh, none of them has had a fair trial. I did not have a fair trial and could not have had under the Espionage Act, uh, which doesn't permit, did not permit me to even to tell the jury ever why I had copied the Pentagon Papers, what my motives were, what I thought the benefit would be, what the harm might have been and what it wasn't. Uh, none of that was allowed in uh, under the strict liability of the Espionage Act, which is what Snowden would be tried under. The fact is, I did have a fair ending to my trial. 
it was charges were dismissed because of governmental misconduct against me. Just briefly, Edward, do you think you'll ever be able to come back? You know, it, there's, there's no question that I am living in exile, and I continue uh, to expect to live in exile uh, for the foreseeable future. At the same time, the government's primary basis uh, for criticizing me for taking a strong position against me is that they say it's caused some damage. Uh, but now we're in 2015, uh, and the government has never at any point demonstrated any evidence of any harm that's occurred as a result of these disclosures. And in fact, with each passing year, we see more and more evidence that this has done a pr tremendous public good. The laws inside the United States and outside the United States are all changing as a result of this information. And we are actually living in a more safe uh, and better world that has greater respect for human rights as a result of the fact that we, the people, are now a part of the decision making about this topic in government. I believe you also told a journalist who broke your story to spread out the documents uh, you gave them because, quote, if the government thinks you're the single point of failure, they'll kill you. Do you really believe President Obama would have ordered the assassination of journalists as high profile, as well known as Glenn Greenwald, then of The Guardian, and Barton Gelman of The Washington Post? Surely you don't actually believe that. Certainly not in a way that would not be deniable. But at the same time, we have to look at the history of these cases. The president of the United States has already authorized the extrajudicial killing of a United States citizen far from any battlefield. Uh, and when you have that precedent set and you think about the fact that from the government's perspective, uh, these programs uh, were necessary. They were vital to the national security of the entire nation. Uh, and there was one individual somewhere uh, who by interfering with sort of their, their ordinary operations, uh, by doing any kind of operation, whether it was stealing their, uh, their working materials, their journalistic materials, or whether it was indeed uh, interacting with them in a physical nature, which would basically, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going as far as to saying they would be killed. I, I do think that's a little bit too far. But the bottom line is you have to prepare journalists uh, who have never worked in intelligence, who aren't uh, sort of, you know, they, they don't have a history in the Central Intelligence Agency, how seriously to take the reporting process. And when you say, if you are the single point of failure, if you make some mistake and advertise yourself uh, as the one individual who the government can act against to stop this story, they will do so, I think that's a fair point and an important one to be made. How about Hillary Clinton, former U.S. Secretary of State? Um, she uh, accused you last year of helping terrorists with your NSA leaks. Now she's being accused of mishandling classified data on her own private email servers. She's even being investigated by the FBI, the Justice Department. How would you describe Hillary Clinton? What would you say to her now? Now, this is a problem because anyone who has the clearances that the Secretary of State has or the director of any top-level agency has knows uh, how classified information should be handled. And if an ordinary worker at the State Department or the Central Intelligence Agency or anything like that were sending details about the security of embassies, which is alleged to be in her emails, uh, meetings with private government officials, uh, foreign government officials, and the statements that were made to them in confidence over unclassified email systems, they would not only lose their job uh, and lose their clearance, they would very likely face prosecution. Do for you it. think she potentially endangered US national security by being so careless with her email? From what you know about email well, and it's hacking? It's not my place to say that. But what I can say is when the unclassified systems of the United States government, which has a full-time information security staff, regularly get hacked, the idea that someone keeping a private server in the renovated bathroom of a server farm in Colorado yes. uh, is more secure uh, is completely ridiculous. Last year, when I interviewed Jimmy Wales, the founder of Wikipedia, he called you a hero. Uh, Daniels called you a hero, too. Actor Matt Damon says his new Bourne film is inspired by you. So you're even inspiring action films. Other, others think you're a traitor. Uh, John Kerry, Secretary of State, has called you a traitor and a coward. Uh, Donald Trump, who's leading the race for the Republican presidential nomination, he called you a total traitor and said this about you. This guy's a bad guy. And, you know, there is still a thing called execution. Execution. Are you worried about what a President Trump might do to you? No, I'm, I'm not. Uh... <laughs> You know, it, it's very difficult to respond in a serious way to any statement that's made by Donald Trump. Um, but when you've got Donald Trump uh, and John Kerry on one hand and people like Jimmy Wales who are improving the world 
Uh, on the other hand, I, I think it's obvious which side that most people would rather be on. Um, however, it's not about who's right and who's wrong. The arguments about whether I'm a good guy and a bad guy are, are a complete uh, a red herring. Say someone contacts you via encrypted email or whatever it is, and they say to you, you know what, I'm seeing horrible things. I want to go forward. I want to do what you did. But I see what you went through. I see what you had to give up. Should I do it or not? What advice would you give them? Do it or not do it? Uh, I, I, I think it would in a, be inappropriate to give specific advice. Uh, but what I would say is this is what my work at the Freedom of the Press Foundation is about. Uh, where we try to create paradigms where people can not only reveal government wrongdoing uh, about serious violations of people's rights on an individual and a massive population-based scale, but that they can also be safe in doing it. We have created new tools, new infrastructures, where people do not have to do and make the same choices uh, that they have in the past, where they realize if they stood up and said something, if they said the government is breaking the law, that they would suffer for it. They can, in the future, maintain their anonymity at the same time that they provide a vital public service in telling us the truth of what's really going on within the government. Daniel, do you think he's best off where he is, or do you want to see him back in America? Do you think he's actually better off staying where he is? I don't think he can ever come back to America. I don't think, uh, unless the law changes very significantly, I think the intelligence services will never forgive him for embarrassing them and curtailing their illegal activities. And I think their influence on future presidents is likely to be enough that I don't foresee his being able to come back. Edward, you're a modest man, and I understand you don't like it being all about you, but people are fascinated by you. I'm fascinated by you. I read an interview where you said you'd seen House of Cards, and I'm thinking, does this guy have a subscription to Netflix? How does he go shopping? Does he use a credit card? Because you're trying to stay off the grid. You're worried about US intelligence following you. How do you live? How do you shop every day? Do you get to go out? Are you going to be able to go out and watch the next Bourne film with Matt Damon inspired by you? Are you going to go to the cinema? Sure. You know, I, I, I've, I've met with a, a number of activists, uh, a number of political figures uh, around the world. I, I even met with Daniel Ellsberg uh, out, out here locally. Uh, I live a normal life. I ride the subway uh, like anybody else. Uh, the idea that people have that, you know, I have to live under a rock uh, is a fundamental misunderstanding, I think, of how the nature of exile has changed. The government may be able to prevent me from physically returning home to the United States and engaging with people uh, in person, but the ultimate result of that because of advances in technology means I, I can't shop at Walmart, but I can still lecture at Princeton. And you can chat to me here in Washington, D.C. Edward Snowden, Daniel Ellsberg, thanks so much to both of you for joining me on our very first Upfront. The so-called migrant crisis has left Europe's leaders reaching for some pretty vile analogies. You've got a swarm of people coming across the Mediterranean. It's a bit, if you want, like a house where you live, there is a canalization that explodes. Yeah, a pipe. Europe can't be expected to host all of the refugees, can it? Well, it doesn't. Hardly any of them, actually. 86% of refugees are in developing countries, and that's up from 70% 10 years ago. Take Syrians. There are currently 350,000 of them who have applied for asylum in Europe, which works out to a whopping 0.069% of the EU's total population. Compare that to tiny Lebanon, home to over a million Syrian refugees, which means nearly one out of every five people in that country right now is a refugee. You might say, well, fair enough. Gulf countries haven't taken any yet. Plus, Lebanon is right next to Syria, whereas EU countries are much further away. And that's the reason why up until last month, poor old Britain had agreed to resettle just 187, yes, just 187 Syrian refugees. Or why Slovakia has pledged to take just 200, as long as they're Christian and not Muslim, mind you. Well, think again. Brazil, not exactly Syria's next door neighbor, has resettled almost 10 times more refugees from that country than the UK under the UN scheme. Hmm. Sadly, it took a heartbreaking image to make some notice the tragedy unfurling. But here's the hypocrisy. When European countries were preparing to militarily intervene in Libya, refugees mattered. Do we want a situation where a failed pariah state festers on Europe's southern border, potentially threatening our security, pushing people across the Mediterranean? Well, that worked out, didn't it? The bottom line seems to be that when it comes to bombing your country or overthrowing your dictator, Europeans are on your side and are ready to spend billions. 
But if you're just trying to flee your dictator or escape the bombs, well, the door is closed. What's the future for Iraq, given all the violence and chaos there? The former head of the US Army, General Ray Odierno, says partitioning the country might be the only solution. Iraq's top Shia cleric, Ayatollah Ali Sistani, said last month that without real reform, Iraq could be, quote, dragged to partition. Remember, ISIL now controls one third of the country's territory, while Iraq's Kurds have very little interest in being governed from Baghdad. But in a recent and much discussed op-ed, the country's top diplomat here in Washington, D.C., said those predicting partition couldn't be more wrong. Iraq's ambassador to the United States, Luqman Faili, joins me now. Why are you so sure that a formal partition of Iraq won't happen, given an informal one seems to have already happened on the ground? Thank you for having me on the show. I think uh, Iraqis are not calling for it. Uh, the international community are not calling for it. Geopolitics does not allow it. ISIS or Daesh are calling for it. Do we want to fulfill their wishes? No way. We think the unity of Iraq will be the best deal in defeating Daesh and helping with the prosperity and stability of Iraq. So it's an Iraqi call for unity. You say that only ISIS is calling for it, but as I mentioned, the top American general who ran the war in Iraq says it's the only solution because it's so divided. Even the top Shia cleric in the country, Ayatollah Sistani, says it may happen, whether you like it or not, it may happen. I don't see it. At all, ever? I don't see it. I'm talking about in, in the reading of the current okay. reading and the desires and wishes of the Iraqis. You say desires of the Iraqis. You're both Kurdish and Shia. Uh, what's your message to your fellow Kurds who always seem to be agitating to be free from the Shia-led government uh, in Baghdad. They seem to well, want to go their well, own way, your fellow Baghdad is a has a government which is representative of the whole of Iraq. The cabinet is the reflection of the whole of Iraq, so it's not a Shia-led. My own personal belief is that there is no time and there is certainly not appetite for it ge geopolitically, and Iraqis don't want it. The Kurds themselves, they have adhered to the constitution. But the Kurds want it. Let's you know. Let's be honest. You know, you know better than I do. The Kurds want to be free. Well, they want their own uh, state. But also, the Kurds know the realities of the situation and know, know what's the best for them. The, there is a better stability, prosperity, development for the Kurds as part of Iraq. Iraqis also want that. They Even, say they say that actually it's better for them to go it alone, sell their own oil, get their own money. Right now, they're arguing with the central government well, over how us? the revenues are we split. Have, we have a constitution which we all agree to. That's what's binding us. Are the Kurds sticking to the constitution when it comes well, to oil sales? Well, they have sales? to stick to the constitution. Are they sticking? Every, not whether they have every, to. Everybody has to stick to but the constitution. are they sticking to the constitution? We are an, we are an evolving democracy. I'll we are take having that as a, a no, then. We have also... No, let's be, also be talk about that. We are encouraging decentralization by the nature of the constitution and the desires of the people. Your critics are quite clear that you, they say, are the representative of a sectarian pro-Shia, anti-Sunni government. What do you say to that? Well, the president is a Sunni Kurd. Uh, the minister of defense is a Sunni Arab. I'm a Kurd Shia. The prime minister is a, Kurd, uh, is a Shia Arab. But you don't, you don't accept any claims, then, that the government no, behaved no, no. in a way no, that marginalized some democracy. of the Sunnis who went into the hands? We are a new democracy. We are at the very early age of a new state. So this part of dialogue is, is required. No single entity can say that they are free from abusing others. That's what took place, unfortunately, in 2005 and 6 and 7. Now we have a coalition government who focused on unity. That's reflected in the parliament. It's reflected in the cabinet. Just on all the violence, you mentioned Daesh, ISIL. We We've seen their atrocity videos, but now we're seeing some pretty horrific videos uh, from some of the pro-government so-called Shia militias. Uh, one recent video which went viral showed a top Iraqi Shia commander mutilating the dead corpse of an ISIL fighter. Why doesn't your government stop such things from happening? Well, the prime minister has made public that he takes any of these claims seriously. He, he, we have zero tolerance for them. But you say zero time, tolerance, but they're happening. No, you no, just have to no, go on YouTube. I'm not, I'm not uh, denying that they are not happening, but the, as a system no. Do we deal with it when we know about these issues? Yes, we do. Do we have a 100% professional army? No, but we're working, as I said, we are a project in the making. That's still ongoing. We need support in, in relation to further professionalism, further training and others. And you would agree issue. that the behavior but, of some but, of these groups on the ground acts as a recruiting sergeant for Daesh, for at, ISIL? Certainly, certainly. But at the same time, we also know that Daesh have no rule of engagement. They create a choice of CCs. That's why we need to have a more professional training and we need support in that aspect as well. Ambassador Faley, thanks for joining me in the arena. Thank you. That's our show. Upfront, we'll be back next week.